The state changed over uh, the course of uh, the late 18th century and the 19th century in uh, the way in which uh, uh, power uh, was uh, distributed in the, uh, in the, during the French regime, uh, power was uh, very much at the top, at the center, of course, uh, in theory with the king himself back in France, but he delegated power to a governor, um, to an intendant responsible for uh, financial matters as well. Uh, uh, but but uh, they pretty much decided uh, what would happen. Uh, they might occasionally consult others or occasionally even consult the people, but there were no ongoing structures whereby the people were represented in government. That was true at the beginning of the history of Nova Scotia, but quite quickly uh, there the um, uh, governor uh, was advised and shared authority uh, with others. There was a council uh, to advise him, an appointed council, but representative government came for the first time uh, in 1758 in Nova Scotia, uh, and that's really the first time in Canada as a whole, or what later would become Canada. Uh, by representative government, we mean that uh, uh, the people choose uh, individuals to represent them, uh, to speak for them, uh, and that uh, there's uh, an assembly, this was the word used at the time before House of Commons became the familiar term, an assembly, uh, a legislative assembly, uh, where uh, the views of the people uh, could be heard by authority. Um, part of the idea was to legitimate authority, that the uh, uh, state uh, hoped to have uh, the support of the people uh, and uh, one way of getting that, getting their support was to say, well, you have a say in things, you have a share in power. And that's partly what these uh, representatives were doing in the houses of assembly that were set up. Again, we see an unevenness across the country. Representative government came later everywhere else. It came to uh, Upper Canada, later Ontario, to Lower Canada, uh, later Quebec in 1791 with the Constitutional Act, which uh, uh, for the first time uh, introduced representative institutions. There was again a, a House of Assembly for each of these colonies and uh, people uh, elected representatives uh, to these assemblies. Uh, in the West, it was uh, uh, representative government came later still. Uh, push forward uh, in 1870 uh, by the year 69, 70 by the Riel Rebellion where uh, the Métis population and others at uh, Red River, what would later become Manitoba, soon become Manitoba, uh, uh, demanded that their views be heard and um, they were successful in persuading Ottawa to create a uh, provincial government with representative institutions there. In the rest of the uh, prairies, uh, and that meant uh, most of what's now Manitoba, because the original Manitoba was very tiny, most of what's now Manitoba, all of Saskatchewan and Alberta and going north into the uh, Northwest Territories of today, th this was all the Northwest Territories. Um, and um, the idea was that again, the governor would have most of the power. He would consult with council and representative government would be only introduced gradually with the coming of more uh, settlers to the West. The fear was you couldn't give um, the right to elect uh, representatives. You didn't want to hear the voice of Aboriginal people who numbered uh, the greatest on the prairies at the outset. Uh, so only gradually was representative government introduced uh, over the course of the late 19th century in the Northwest Territories of the Prairie Region. British Columbia, a slightly different story, but only slightly. Uh, again, we have the, uh, a governor uh, uh, consulting uh, with councillors, and uh, over the course of some time, 
um, uh, elections held and representatives introduced into the system. But it really was uh, only in 1871 when British Columbia became uh, a province of uh, the Dominion of Canada that a full-fledged system of, respons uh, of representative government uh, was created. Responsible government is different from representative government. Uh, it's it's an, uh, an aspect of constitutional change that took place where we had representative government already. And it took uh, uh, several decades of, of, of struggle, of conflict, uh, before responsible government uh, came into play. Uh, representative government was terrific in the idea that people uh, could have a say at, at the center and have a share in power. But so often it seemed that the, the governor and his cronies, his friends, uh, uh, really had all the power and they didn't listen much to the legislative assembly. It was supposed to be there to help make the laws, that's what a legislature does, but in fact the legislative council often uh, threw out the laws that the legislative assembly tried to put forward or the bills that the legislative uh, assembly tried to pass, so the people's voice wasn't being heard and much of the uh, political struggle of the 1820s and 30s and into the 1840s in um, uh, uh, Central Canada and the Maritimes was around issues of letting the people have a stronger voice in government uh, and uh, finding ways to do that. And one uh, solution was to introduce uh, responsible government. Um, that term was very popular at the time and actually had many meanings and was rather confusing. Uh, sometimes it meant just the opposite of arbitrary government, uh, but it had a more particular meaning uh, for people like uh, the Baldwins uh, here in uh, Toronto who, who uh, argued that uh, the executive um, should have uh, uh, the support of uh, a majority in the legislature and that normally the members of the executive branch of government would be chosen from the legislature. When the, uh, that's the essence of the responsible government right there. And that was uh, 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 introduced uh, in a kind of piecemeal uh, fashion through the 1840s, but by the end of the 1840s, uh, in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, in uh, the province of Canada, uh, responsible government uh, was in place. This had something to do with the British government, the imperial government too, which by this point was willing to uh, uh, and allow the colonies to go their own way. This is the era of free trade after all in the 1840s, the repeal of the corn law and the navigation acts. Uh, and the, the, the government of, of uh, Great Britain decided that the colonies should take responsibility for local matters that were of real, uh, no real concern to the, the imperial authorities at the center in London. Uh, and uh, so we see by the, by the late 1840s, the, the colony enjoy, colonies enjoying more self-government, more autonomy within the empire. That's associated with the coming of responsible government. Uh, the governors uh, are uh, more symbolic now than active in managing uh, politics and in making all the important decisions. Uh, the authority that really seems to matter now is the cabinet or the executive council uh, in, in the governments. Um, uh, these were, uh, the members of the executive council under responsible government were chosen from the legislature and uh, they had to have the support of a majority of members of the legislature to govern. And so uh, this was a way in which uh, the people got a stronger uh, control over the decision making and the power and many were happy about that, they struggled for that, this was a success. At the same time though, it strengthened the executive, the executive became more effective, more efficient, more able to rule. Uh, and so uh, in some ways there was a, a trade-off for people uh, because they felt that the weight of the state uh, more directly thanks to the way in which power was shored up under responsible government.